Our Old Testament scripture reading today comes from the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 4, we'll be reading verse 38 to 44, the end of the chapter. And Elisha came again to Gilgal when there was a famine in the land. And as the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, he said to his servant, set on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. One of them went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it his, hit, gathered from it his lap full of wild gourds and came and cut them up into the pot of stew, not knowing what they were. And they poured out some for the men to eat. But while they were eating of the stew, they cried out, O oh, man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat it. He said, Then bring flour. And he threw it into the pot and said, Pour some out for the men that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God bread of the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley, and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And Elisha said, Give to the men that they may eat. But his servant said, How can I set this before a hundred men? So he repeated, Give them to the men that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left. So he set it before them. And they ate and had some left according to the word of the Lord. Where we've seen in the Gospel of John, as we've been working through that book lately, uh, how John the Baptist in many ways uh, played the role in the narrative of Elijah. He was an Elijah-type figure. Well, in, in a similar way, we could say that Jesus could be paralleled to the ministry of Elisha. Uh, this is something that many have seen over the years, that there, there's a strong parallel between the work of Christ and the work of the prophet Elisha. Elisha, you'll remember, is the prophet that, that came after Elijah, that, that took on his mantle, that carried on his ministry. And there are many miracles that Elisha performed that are reminiscent of the miracles that Jesus would perform. One of them we find here with this multiplication of barley loaves. Uh, I, you know, I read this this week as I was studying John chapter 6, and in my mind, I thought, man, I don't think I've ever seen this before. And then I, I keep a certain Bible that I've used for many years next to my bedside at night, and I took it as I was starting to fall asleep last night, and I typically will try to read through the text that I'm going to be preaching and, and teaching through the next day. And so I open it up, and I go to 2 Kings 4, and I have written, I do, I write in some of my Bibles, I've written, you know, that this is just like the loaves and fish. And so evidently, I've, I've seen that before, right? As you read it, it sounds familiar, doesn't it? That here you have the multiplication, specifically of barley loaves, much like the story of the loaves and fish that Jesus will multiply. We're told that there was a famine in the land, and and so it makes sense that food would be somewhat at the center of the story. It's become a major priority. The text is set up as, as there is a need for provision. In what we just read, it starts with this story of this poisonous stew. Something's put into a stew that will bring death. Uh, and then the, the fix, the way that Elisha fixes all this is by, by putting something else into the stew, not by taking something out, but by putting uh, flour into it. And then he says that they can, they can drink it, they can pour it out and, and eat it. I don't know what to do with that part of this story. I, just to be totally honest, I don't fully understand. I'm fascinated by it. Uh, I'm, I'm intrigued by it. Uh, I'm not sure what to do with it. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound a little bit like the story we read of the waters of Marah, the bitter waters, the poisonous waters that, that Moses adds a log or a tree to, and that makes them life-giving? It sounds quite familiar, but, but I'm still not sure what all to do with it, except that it sets things up with Elisha and his servants 
his servants who see this miraculous work. And then in the very next story, and this is where I, I, why I chose this text, that we'd focus on that second part, still happening in a time of famine, but you have this multiplication of food that's brought to Elisha. And you have the doubt of his servants that it can be done. Right? You have his servants doubting whether that could happen. Now you might say, look, look what Elisha just did in the very story before. Uh, we know that he, he can do that which is miraculous, and yet they still didn't think that this was possible. Again, during this time of famine, you have a man who brings a kind of first fruits offering of barley loaves and grain to the prophet. It's an incredible act of faith. During times of famine, uh, you would have you know, a great danger for everybody that was around, but particularly, particularly for the poor. And the barley loaves were the, the cheapest of foods. So what we know is that this is likely somebody who is quite poor. And yet the very first fruits, the very first bit of grain that they get, that they receive, they bring it to the man of God. They offer it up to the Lord. It's a tremendous act of faith giving up the first food to the spiritual head of the people of Israel, even when death was a very realistic possibility. And what does God do with it? He multiplies it. Elisha's servant, again, he doubts that what he's told to do is possible. Right? There's, there's 20 loaves, there's 100 men. And we're not talking about huge loaves. This is, this is a little bit of food. It's not much. And yet, how does Elisha respond? He says, no, go and do it. Why? Because the Lord has said. Because the Lord said through Elisha, they shall eat and have some left. And they do. According to the word of the Lord, Everything that was needed, not just for a small amount of, of what they would need, but abundantly more than what they would need was given. Abundantly more than what they needed was given according to the word of God. Your God, congregation of Christ, is not stingy. He may withhold from you something for a time, uh, but even that he does in order to give you something, right? He, he does that as a father often withholds, right? As a father does not give the full inheritance to his child when, when he's still an adolescent, but rather withholds some in order, to teach him, in order to teach him and help him to grow up into maturity before he bestows upon him what he's going to give. So even in withholding at times, God is giving. But he isn't stingy. He's not withholding in the sense that he, he doesn't give. No, he gives abundantly more than we need. He has given everything that you need for life and godliness, for life and virtue. It may not always look like it's enough, Right? It might not always seem to you, at least from an earthly perspective, that it will be enough. And yet, what God gives is always more than enough. Our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of John. We'll be reading John chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. Hear the word of the Lord. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him, because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, 
for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is God's holy and inspired word for us this morning. You know, this is one of the most iconic stories in all of the Gospels. And one of the reasons for that is that this is the only miracle that Jesus performed outside of his resurrection that is spoken of in every gospel, in every account of the signs that Jesus did. This is the only one that shows up in every gospel account. That alone should pique our interest a little bit. But it's also such a vivid story. It sticks out in our minds, this small amount of food, these small loaves, these small fish, and it's multiplied to feed this large amount of people. It seems to me almost more extraordinary than some of the accounts of people being raised from the dead in the Gospels. Not because that's not extraordinary, but, but even in our own day with modern technology, there are times that somebody is in some sense dead to us. We think that they are dead, and yet they come back. They're brought back to life in a way. And that's obviously much different than, say, Lazarus being already buried in the tomb and then being called forth. That's, that's still a tremendous miracle. It's just that we can almost imagine it, I think, in a way that taking such a small amount of food and distributing it to a massive crowd of people seems almost harder. Like, it's, it's almost less possible to imagine such a thing happening. And yet, that's exactly what did happen. So, what are we to learn from this? To best understand what Jesus is teaching, I think you first have to realize this, that at least at this point in the story, Jesus has his focus on his disciples, not on the crowds. That's what's emphasized here, at least what John emphasizes. Now, there's going to be much more said to the crowds. This miracle is going to be used by Jesus as a launching pad to speak to the crowds about how he is the true manna from heaven, that he's the, the, the true bread from heaven, that he is the bread of life. He's going to speak to them later. We're also going to see that this points to the fact that Jesus is a new and greater Moses, something that's going to be a theme from here through the whole of, of chapter 6 of the Gospel of John. But before all of that is made clear, we have Jesus sitting down with his disciples, speaking to his disciples. In what we just read, Jesus doesn't speak to the crowds at all. He speaks to his disciples. So this is a lesson, first of all, primarily for you as a church. Jesus is more than enough. 
even a little offered up to Christ is more than enough to accomplish Christ's purposes on earth. And what God has given us as a church, we can trust he will multiply to meet the needs, not just of all those that he calls to be ministered to, but also to meet all of our needs and so much more. If God wants us to accomplish something, he will provide more than enough of what is needed in himself. Right? In Christ himself is more than enough of what is needed for life and godliness in this world. Read with me again verses 1 to 2. It sets up the account. We're told after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Remember, he's been in Jerusalem. And now he's, he's left that. And he's gone to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd is following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. This is just after the account of the invalid that's, that's made to be able to walk. And we know that Jesus was doing many more signs than John himself recounts when he was in Jerusalem. So he's healed many. Many have seen what he's done, these signs, but they begin to follow him on the basis of those signs, not yet, as we've seen over and over again, not yet on the basis of his words, which is how those signs are accomplished. It's according to the word of God that he accomplishes these great things, yet they don't yet trust him at his word they trust these things that he's doing they're excited about these powerful miraculous things that are being accomplished among them and now jesus has gone out to the countryside out along the shore of the sea of galilee there was a kind of hill country right a mountainous region they've gone out near the town of bethsaida which john has mentioned before And here, the crowds find them. They come out to reach them. Verse 3, Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. You know, very often when when we think about the story of the loaves and the fish, probably what we think of most is Jesus' interaction with the crowds that he provides all of this for the crowds and and that he gives out all of this food to the crowds. And again, the focus of John is actually on Jesus and the disciples. That Jesus goes and he sits down with his disciples. Jesus is going to speak three different times only to his disciples at this point. It won't be until they go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee that he'll speak to the rest of the crowds. For now, it is focused on these men that are with him. They go up into the hill country, right, on a mountain or or in the the hill country by the Sea of Galilee, and, and the focus, the context is with those disciples, and it's near the time of Passover. It's near this time when Israel would celebrate the exodus they'd celebrate with unleavened bread with with a sacrifice of a spotless lamb what it is that god did in redeeming them bringing them out of egypt this is going to play an important role both in what jesus speaks to his disciples but also later on as jesus will speak of being manna from heaven as he talks to the crowds later on and he says you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood if you want to follow after me as my disciple it's going to be important but even here you get pieces of the truth that jesus is like a new moses he ascends the mountain he brings teaching to his followers just after this story what we'll look at next week jesus will walk on water and he'll he'll make sure that his disciples are safely brought to the other side of the sea he is 
a new Moses. And here he sits with his disciples and he tests them. They look, we're told, lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward them. They, they can see from where they're sitting a large crowd coming. Now we're told later on that there were 5,000 men in the crowd. But that doesn't include the women and the children that we're almost definitely with as well. This could be as many as 20,000 people streaming toward them as they've gone off into the countryside. They can see them from quite a ways. And this is around the time of Passover. And Passover we think of in the religious context because that's what we know of it from the Scripture. We know of, of the the ways that Christ is a new Passover lamb and how we, we read the story of Exodus and the ways that, that Christ has fulfilled those things. But at this time in Israel's history, although those, those things were true, they were looking for a Messiah, a new Moses. But also Passover had become something of a, of a, a strong kind of nationalistic event where people would become quite excitable and riled up about their situation of, of being a nation that was under the foot of the Romans. And they were looking for the prophet, a new Moses figure, that would lead them out against the Romans, that would destroy the Romans like the Egyptians were destroyed in the Red Sea. They were looking for a Messiah that would, would lead them to do this. And every Passover became a kind of, a, a big kind of protest in a way. They were this 20,000-person crowd, they were already likely very excitable. They were very zealous. And here they're streaming toward the disciples and toward Christ. And we're not told that the disciples look, right? Christ sees the crowds coming, and that's what causes him to speak to the disciples. But you know that they see it too that they see what's happening, and they're probably worried. I think we're supposed to assume they're going to be on edge. They're nervous, simply trying to keep some kind of control over a group that size is a monumental task, especially at this season, right, during this festival. And what does Jesus say to them? Does he offer words of encouragement? Right? Don't worry. I see them too. Everything's going to be okay. No, he doesn't. Instead, he specifically calls out Philip, one of the disciples, and says, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Now, why does he call on Philip? Well, if you remember, Philip is from Bethsaida. That's the closest town to where they are. And so, Philip is a local. In essence, Jesus is saying, Philip, what restaurants will cater to 20,000 people for us right now? Right? Who's, who's open right now that we could go and pick up food for everybody that you see streaming toward you? Now, I know that some of you get nervous when you have weeks in advance to prepare for somebody to come and visit your home, right? When you're, when you're showing somebody hospitality, you're bringing them over, but you have to provide a meal. You want to make sure your, your home's all ready. Right? I know that some of you in here, if somebody just showed up to your house out of the blue, even though probably you have plenty of food in your house, you have plenty of space, it would be easy to host somebody, you would get pretty nervous, even if it was just one family, right? Or one neighbor that stops by and they evidently are going to stick around. Imagine 20,000 people showing up in the countryside, not in town, in the countryside. And Jesus says, what are we going to do to feed them? 
20,000 hungry people. They've already gone quite a distance to follow Jesus, and they start showing up. Where are we going to get food for all of them, Jesus says. Where will you look to provide for people like this? That's the test for the disciples. Right? Where will you look with a crowd this size, when a world full of desperate and needy people start flocking toward you, even with the wrong intentions, where will you go to find them help? Where will you point them to find provision? How will you provide it? As I said, Jesus is doing this to test them. We're told that in verse 6. He said this to test them, for he himself knew what he would do. It's all a task. He knows what's going to happen. Of course, he has a plan. But the disciples don't know his plan. Yes, he knows what he's going to do. They don't know what he's going to do. He hadn't shared it with them. But we're confronted with the question of, do you really need to know the plan, or do you simply need to know the one who always has the plan? Do you need to know the details, or do you simply need to trust and do that which you're commanded to do by the one who you know knows the details. The disciples have seen every sign that Jesus has done. They know what he can do. They know who he is. They can trust him. But like all of us would, when put in such a situation, the disciples are clearly a little bit in shock. They question what Jesus is asking. Verse 7 says, Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Philip responds in what is a perfectly rational way. A denarii was uh, kind of the average man's daily wage at this time. So he's saying 200 days worth of wages. Right? Two-thirds of a year's worth of wages wouldn't even be enough for everybody to get a little bit. Right? If you, Jesus, if you gave us $40,000, I could go and pick something up whatever we could scrounge together, and maybe everybody would get a bite. Maybe everybody would get a crumb. In other words, what's he saying? Lord, it's not possible to do what you're asking. And sometimes we have Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, held up as, you know, kind of a, an example of faith in this situation. Because he goes and he, he does something, right? He brings a boy. He says, look, I did find some food. This boy has these barley loaves, these fish. But he also questions Christ. But what are they for so many? In other words, he also does not think this is possible. He assessed what food was available in the crowd, and it's not enough. Now, if you had been here for the series on John so far, as we've been reading through this gospel, and even if you didn't know anything else about the rest of this story, you would actually know that what is in front of them is enough. Why? Because the boy brings five barley loaves and two fish. That makes seven. And John loves numbers. Right? It's not an accident that he mentions that. This is the number of completion. It actually will be enough. We know that. We might not know how it's going to be enough, but, but we can see that it will be. If the disciples remembered who they were serving, and if they remembered in this moment what he can do, then they would have eyes to see that what they have is actually more than enough already. 
It doesn't seem that way from an earthly perspective. It doesn't seem possible that Jesus can do what he's asked them to do. The most they have is a poor boy's food, right? One small boy's lunch. They think, how could we possibly accomplish this? But what they should probably ask, knowing who Jesus is, they should probably ask, Jesus, what do you want us to do? Verse 10, Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. Jesus is the good shepherd, and he leads his sheep to the pastures that they need. And here in this grassy place, he has everybody sit down. And he takes what seems to everyone else to be so little. And he wasn't frantic. He wasn't scrambling. He wasn't worried. He was in control the whole time. He always knew what he would do. He wasn't concerned about how they would feed everyone because he already knew. I mean, imagine that even just the time commitment of distributing food, even if you had the food, the amount of time that it would take to serve 20,000 people. And yet Jesus isn't worked up about what the disciples are worried about. What does he do? He starts by giving thanks. A typical Jewish blessing in the first century would have gone something like this. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Jesus isn't worried, and his disciples shouldn't be either, because he is the one that brings forth bread from the earth. This wouldn't even be the first time that he would provide for people in the wilderness. It wouldn't be the first time that he, by his word, multiplied barley loads to make sure that everybody had more than what they needed. And not only does he provide, he provides more than enough until everybody has as much as they wanted, we're told. And even more, verse 12, and when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. Everyone eats their fill and there's enough left over that the disciples gather 12 full baskets. John, even more than in the other gospel accounts of this same event, emphasizes the abundance of what God provides, the abundance of what Jesus gives. There's so much more even left over. There is more at the end than there was when they began. Now, of course, the disciples helped to distribute it all, but John specifically says that Jesus distributed the loaves and the fish. The disciples were worried the whole time, what are we going to do? But Jesus was always able and he was always going to be the one to provide. There is enough in Christ to provide everything that is needed for the church to do what he has commanded her to do. There is enough of Jesus to fill to overflowing every person in the world, let alone La Crosse County. He has enough in himself to provide for everyone's needs. And it's easy when he's commanded us to do something that seems difficult or bigger than what we could accomplish 
it's easy to get bogged down in some of the details, right? How are we going to do this? How is this going to work? But Jesus is reminding his disciples and through them reminding you, I have everything that anyone needs and I'm more than enough for anything you will face. They have more when they're done than when they started. I wish I even had the words to express how profound that is. That what they collect afterward, the scraps afterward, is so much more than when they even began with what looked like it, it's not even going to work. There's 12 baskets full. I think this definitely tells us that Jesus himself has enough in himself for all of Israel, right? For the new Israel that he was establishing. The 12 tribes, all of them could find what was needed in him. But I also wonder if given that the people who knew that there were 12 baskets were the 12 disciples themselves, I wonder if even more so this was specifically for them. Ministry is difficult. What you as a church are called to includes a lot of sacrifice, just as Christ was calling the disciples to a life of sacrifice. The mission given to the disciples was going to require that they trust Jesus' words. They'd follow his words, even when it seems crazy from an earthly perspective. They would be required to sacrifice a lot for him, to give up what little they had, often not even seeing, at least from the get-go, how it would possibly be enough, how it would possibly work to accomplish what he called them to. But what they get to see here firsthand is that even after giving so much away to this crowd, there's still far more left over for them than when they began. Jesus will provide for them. He will give them all that they need to be sustained in what he has called them to. Now for the crowd who's come for all kinds of you know, mixed reasons, They've come out because of the signs Jesus is doing. They've come out because they want to find this prophet that they can install and go and kick out the Romans from Jerusalem and from Israel and to rule the world from that point. And so they see this and they think this must be the prophet. And we're told that they're going to seek to force Jesus to be their king. Now, they weren't wrong that Jesus was the prophet spoken of. They weren't wrong that he was the true king of Israel. Their application of that was completely wrong. And so Jesus, knowing that this was going to happen, goes away, goes off by himself. He withdraws again to the mountain. Congregation of Christ, as you serve Christ with your gifts, with your time, with your energy, with your money, with your strength, with your family, as you offer unto the Lord even what little you have, remember that Jesus will provide for you everything that you most need. What he has called you to as a church the ministry that he has given to Christ's covenant church here in the Cooley region, he will provide more than enough of himself to accomplish it all. It's really easy sometimes for us to fall into a kind of spiritual poverty mindset. A poverty mindset is, is the kind of thing that very often happens if somebody grows up in, in poverty where there's this sense that there's not enough things, there's not enough stuff, there's not enough money, there's not enough something to go around. And so you have to keep it for yourself. You have to scramble to keep and hold on to everything that you have. It makes it hard to give anything away. It makes somebody often very stingy. It's very hard to be generous when you think there's just not enough for everyone. That's what happens when you see the world through a kind of poverty 
lens. There's not enough, there's not possibly enough for everybody. And it's easy to look at spiritual life in that way. But the world isn't like that, and even more so, the kingdom of Christ, even in its visible form in the church, isn't like that. Everything that is necessary for life and godliness, Christ has and does give. In other words, everything that we most need, he does provide. He doesn't withhold, and what he gives, he gives more than enough of. Right, Not just enough for those of us in this room, but enough for the whole world, enough for all of the redeemed. Jesus Christ is more than enough. And there's so many places we could go with that, but let me just give three quick application points as we come to a close. First, what this means is that even if what you think you have to give to Christ isn't much, you can be assured that he can multiply its effect beyond your earthly comprehension. You might think, I don't have much time. I don't have much money. I don't have many gifts that God could really use. But what you give to him is plenty for what he has called you to. You might not ever see the full fruit of the things that you do unto the Lord, but if you give anything up to the Lord in faith, you can know that he will multiply that gift into far more than you can imagine in the moment. This helps us to be faithful even in the smallest of things, right? Because a seed is a very small thing, and yet it grows into something much larger, something that is fruitful that produces even more seeds every little thing that we do unto the lord he will multiply so secondly when you don't think that there's an earthly way to accomplish everything that jesus wants you to do as a church right in in the mission that god has called us to as a church remember that the ministry of the church broadly but also the ministry of this church is his ministry and there's more than enough in him to distribute to anyone that he brings there's more than enough in christ for everyone to receive what they most need god will provide what is needed to accomplish what his word commands if his word commands it he will and has provided what we need to accomplish it. So you must trust him and simply put your hand to the plow. He sends the rain. He sends the sun. He causes the growth. That should be enough for us. And we should be able to say, Lord, I don't get it, but what do you want us to do? I don't see how all these people could be fed, but what would you have us do? Third and finally, when you sacrifice your time, your energy, your money, your family life, or anything else for the mission that God has given to the church, it might be easy to think that that which is given is lost in some way, that you're losing something, that you're distributing to others what you will never get back. But God will provide not just enough for what others need through your work, but for what you most need. Trust him, right? Trust him that there is enough grace and blessing in Christ that to give in his name, for his sake, for his glory, is truly better than to receive. There is more than enough in Jesus Christ for everything that you need. Let's pray. Lord God, we believe. Help our unbelief. Teach us to trust you and what you provide to trust your word 
knowing that you will always give more than enough of what we need, of what others need, of what is needed for the ministry of your church. As we've heard your word, as we truly, Lord, sit in awe of the majesty and wisdom in your word, we pray that you would take it like a seed and plant it deep in our hearts, that you would water it by your spirit, that you would give it growth, that it would produce much fruit in our lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.